Welcome and thank you to, um, to everyone for, um, for joining our preprints webinar today. Um, I'm Rachel, I work on the member and community outreach team at Crossref um, and I'm based in our Oxford office. Um, just to, um, to start with, um, with Crossref itself, um, in case any of, the, any of you aren't familiar, um, we're a not-for-profit membership organisation for scholarly publishers um, and we try to make content easy to find, link, cite and assess. Um, and the kind of things that we're working on are trying to work with um, the the scholarly community, um, we work a lot with metadata and run a shared infrastructure for, um, for people to assign identifiers to, um, to different types of content. Um, and I guess um, making tools and services to, to improve research communications um, is really at the key, at the key of that. So um, we wanted to talk today a little bit about um, preprints and, um, and scholarly infrastructure infrastructure. So I'll start off with um, a little bit, bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm not going to keep you too long to talk about, um, to talk about Crossref itself, um, but then I'm going to hand over um, to um, Jessica Polka from ASAP Bio, um, Martin Rittman from Preprints operated by MDPI, um, and then Richard Seaver from, um, from BioArchive, um, who are going to talk to us about the work that they've been doing with, um, with preprints within their um, organisations and initiatives. Um, and then we'll have a bit of time at the end of the webinar for, um, for questions and, and answers to the panellists. Um, we will keep people on mute during the course of the webinar just because um, it cuts down on, on background noise and means that everyone can hear clearly. Um, we will make the, um, a recording of the webinar available afterwards um, in, case you, you know, in case you have to run off so that you can still pick up on anything that you've missed. Um, I'd ask you just to, um, to keep questions until the end, until um, all of our panellists have spoken. But if you do have questions, um, you can add them into the chat window um, or the, question, the little questions um, box in the GoToWebinar software. And then we'll, we'll pick them up and collate them from there um, and pass them back to the panellists. Um, the reason that we've been, um, that, we're, that we're running a preprint webinar is that um, Towards the end of 2016, um, we did some work at Crossref to, um, to, to, to accept preprints, to have a specific type of um, schema that would, um, that would work for and accept preprints. Um, the reason for doing that is so that um, we can make sure that you know, what we do at Crossref is we, um, we help to provide persistent identifiers for content. And with preprints, it's it's really important that the links to um, to those publications persist over time. Um, it also makes sure, and this is this is the part that that I personally find very interesting, is just making sure that they're connected to the the full history of the shared research results, and that the citation record is clear and up to date. So it's it's very important as a researcher to be able to distinguish between the preprint and the article. But then it's also about making connections as well. So not just the, the direct sort of connection between the preprint and the article, but also the connections that the preprint has out to other related um, other related literature. And then the connections that the article has to, you know, things like um, clinical trials, videos, discussion pieces, peer review, so making sure that, um, that all of that information is, is connected together so that people and computers can explore those relationships. Um, as part of accepting preprints, um, we, um, we allow um, members, Crossref members, to, do, to deposit preprints and to, to join to deposit preprints. Um, 
we allow our members to, to register content and DOIs with us, um, but this custom metadata is, we have some custom metadata or a specific schema um, that lets um, publishers of preprints deposit the information with us in such a way so that it shows preprints as a distinct article type to, say, a journal article, a book chapter, um, or a piece of a piece of grey literature, again, so that it's clear to anyone who's using the metadata what um, what it relates to. Um, we provide notifications um, of links between pre to publishers of preprints who are registering DOIs with us to uh, to try to match those up to the, um, the 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 accepted manuscript or version of record that results um, or results from that preprint. Um, and then we also, if we have ORCID IDs deposited with us, we also help. We also use auto update functionality to um, to add those um, to add the preprints to the the author's ORCID record, so that they don't have to do that themselves. And we also collect um, we also collect funder information related to preprints as well, because again, just making it clear who funded the research at which point in the research cycle is um, is becoming more and more important to um, to funders, um, research institutions, and to, to researchers themselves to be able to share. Um, I'd mentioned our metadata. Um, there's no point taking in lots of um, useful bibliographic funding um, license information if we don't make that available. So we make um, the metadata that we collect available via machine and human interfaces. So we've we have a REST API, OAI PMH, and just a, a, a basic search interface, Crossref Metadata Search, that um, that anyone can go to to try to explore um, the the information that we hold on um, tens of millions of scholarly articles. And as I said, I think around eight thousand of those are are, are related to preprints. Um, I've left a couple of um, examples in the slide. So the the first example um, is a way to, to query the API to ask, okay, show me all of the um, all of the DOIs that have been have been posted uh, that have been deposited with Crossref that relate to that relate to preprints. You can have a look at that, um, or also you can look at the metadata for a specific preprint DOI. Um, Martin, I think this is one of yours. But again, to go in and look at the the links that exist between the preprint and and other publications. So again, we'll we'll share these slides um, with um, with the webinar registrants afterwards. And if you want to read more, there's lots on our blog, and again, the links below. Um, so I don't want to monopolise your time today. So I'm going to I'm going to pass over to um, to Jessica Polka so that she can um, so that she can um, share her thoughts with us today. Thanks, Jessica. Oh no, thank you, Rachel, and uh, thanks also to um, uh, Anna and Jennifer Crossref for allowing me to i uh, tell you a little bit about a researcher's perspective on preprints. So um, I'm now working full-time as director of ASMAP Bio, um, but I first became involved with uh, the project, which is essentially a biologist-driven initiative to promote the productive use of preprints in life sciences um, as a postdoc. Um, and so what I'll be telling you today is a little bit of how we see developments in preprints in biology um, and some um, exciting uh, new policies that I think are really going to enhance their growth over time. Um, so for the purpose of, of this talk, um, preprint, I'm, I'll say, is a, a manuscript post online before journal organized peer review. Um, the term has meant different things at different times, um, but uh, we see it really as uh, equivalent to the way that physicists are using preprints on archives. Um, and that is to say, completely compatible with journal publication. So in this view, a preprint is simply a manuscript posted to a server online um, that uh, is immediately accessible to all of our colleagues, uh, usually during the time that that same manuscript is going through peer review uh, at a journal. And this way, uh, we achieve the, the benefits of sharing immediately with our community members, uh, getting feedback, 
um, and really accelerating the process of science while at the same time still undergoing that certification by peer review. So um, as I've mentioned, preprint servers um, are not a new concept. They've existed for over a quarter of a century. And the preprint server archive, which hosts manuscripts in physics, mathematics, computer science, has about 100,000 manuscripts posted per year. And recently in biology, um, there have been several dedicated servers, um, including BioArchive very prominently, as well as others, um, that are collecting preprints uh, specifically in our field. And what I think is really amazing is that the growth of preprints has just been explosive over the last couple of years. So um, what you'll notice from this graph is that there's a steady growth in uh, preprints posted to archive.org in the QBio section. Um, but a number of other sources have, uh, have assisted um, in the growth of preprints in biology, especially in bioarchive, which has really sort of taken off. And so um, one thing that I just want to highlight is that with these sources and others, um, which are not yet listed here, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, welcome open research, while not exactly a preprint server, hosts manuscripts before peer review. Um, there's an increasing uh, distribution of preprints across different sources, and yet um, the growth is, is really quite startling. So why? Um, what is the what are the benefits of, of preprints? Why are researchers um, like myself so interested in them? First, they allow us to make our work immediately openly accessible, um, and uh, they are a public disclosure of work that would otherwise be invisible for a PhD thesis or a fellowship or a job. For example, um, I've had several occasions when I was applying for fellowship during my postdoc when I'm literally waiting for a manuscript to appear online so I can list it on my CV. Preprints put a little bit more control um, into sharing our work into the hands of researchers. They enable us to get um, additional feedback on our work in much the same way as we would get by presenting at a conference. Um, and they also allow us to uh, specifically timestamp our work to show when we knew it when. In other words, um, in case, especially in cases where there may be some controversy over who discovered something first or uh, for the purpose of um, stating a uh, particular disclosure at a particular time, um, preprints can be very useful for that. But despite all of these, I would say, selfish reasons, the most uh, wonderful part about preprints is that they can cumulatively advance the pace of science. In other words, if I make my research available, others will be able to see it and build off of it sooner. Um, and this process um, it will be additive over time. So um, despite the, the fact that there are still some concerns about scooping um, or uh, journal policies, which are rapidly changing, overwhelmingly, we found at the survey that we conducted on our website, asapbio.org, um, about a year ago, that the overwhelming experience is very positive for uh, biologists who have submitted preprints. And I think that um, the experience will become even more positive in the future. So just in the last year, we've seen a lot of funding agencies enacting policies that enable researchers to include preprints and grants, in other words, to cite them in their applications or in their reports as evidence of productivity. Um, and the NIH has re released a request for uh, information about this process. Um, and we're awaiting a determination about their policy. Um, but the number of other funding agencies who are enacting similar, um, similar policies is growing. And we're keeping track of this at the URL at the bottom of your screen. Some uh, funders are even going further than just enabling researchers to have the option to cite them. For example, um, at the Chan Zuckerberg uh, Science uh, Investigatorship applications, they specify that uh, the Biohub uh, investigators will be required to post manuscripts on archive on the data submission to peer review journals. So um, I, I understand that the choice of archive um, is uh, not necessarily just specify that only this preprint server will be allowed, um, but the point being that um, some funders are in a position to make a very strong policy in favor of this early open sharing. And um, a similar thing happened with uh, the 40 Nucleon Project, which is a, a consortium of about 50 PIs uh, who collectively have decided on their own to have a policy within their group. 
uh, to post preprints at the time of submission. So given that there is all of this movement in funding agencies, um, some journals are also really taking progressive policies uh, with preprints to kind of take advantage of the potential for innovation here. For example, um, we've been seeing um, some reports on Twitter about scientists getting invited to submit manuscripts to journals. In other words, the journal editors are looking uh, at preprint servers and trying to invite uh, manuscripts. And obviously researchers love this. Um, it's a very efficient way to uh, conduct matchmaking between a manuscript and a journal. And PLOS Genetics has actually formalized this process by um, instituting preprint editors. So these are essentially three editors whose job it is to recruit manuscripts from preprint servers. Um, another really important um, and, and valuable feature is in linking preprints to journals. Um, just as um, you just heard from Rachel, uh, researchers, I think, uh, are very interested in knowing where the, the manuscript came from and where that preprint eventually ends up. So um, many preprint servers are already showing researchers the, uh, a link to the article uh, once it's published. But I think doing this in both directions is going to be incredibly valuable. So an example of a journal doing this is by a physical journal who say that they will allow researchers to list the DOI uh, of a preprint um, in the published journal. So this is another example of preprints really getting um, treated as formal first class research objects, which is going to be so critical um, for uh, their widespread use. So um, just to, to give you a brief context for ASAP Bio, um, we are, a, as I mentioned, a group of biologists interested in promoting the best use of preprints in our profession. So we are undertaking um, several different activities in this regard. For example, we're convening stakeholders together, scientists, publishers, funders, to talk about these issues. Um, we are sharing information. Um, our website hosts frequently ask questions. We track policies from funders and, and journals, um, et cetera. And we try to raise awareness, by, especially among communities of researchers, about preprints. And finally, um, we are in the process of proposing additional preprint infrastructure. So um, one of the challenges with preprints in biology from the perspective of a researcher is that um, there are so many different sources of preprints, which on one hand is really wonderful um, for all of this, uh, the potential for innovation and the general increase in number of preprints, but it also can make preprints a bit difficult to find um, and uh, can cause some uncertainty about the standards for scholarly preservation, um, ethical screening, et cetera. So we are proposing a service that would aggregate preprints together um, and in, a, in order to make them more accessible to both human and machine readers. Um, and we are planning to release a request for applications for this service um, in the very near future. Um, and if you're interested in this, I'd be very happy to answer any questions um, by email. We have some more information on our website as well. So thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, Jessica, thank you very much for that um, for that um, for that overview. And yeah, as I said, some really interesting initiatives coming from um, yeah from across the community, but especially from um, from funders. Um, I'm going to switch over now to um, to Martin um, from. Um, from preprints.org. So this all worked very smoothly earlier. So um, let's see if it still does this time. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, yep, I can see your screen and I can hear you. Perfect. <laughs> Good. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Rachel, for the, the invitation to just say, say something about preprints.org. Uh, and I thought I would just give, um, more or less give an overview of our approach to preprints uh, and, and a few kind of practical um uh, points about how we're, we've implemented that and, uh, and, and with Crossref as well. Um, so yeah, preprints.org is, is run by MDPI. We're uh, an open access publisher um, and we're, we're interested in, I mean we have, we have journals but we're interested in other ways to, uh, to, to disseminate um, research knowledge as well and um, preprint seems a really good opportunity to, to very rapidly disseminate knowledge. Um, 
you know, papers can get stuck in peer review for a long time, and uh, and and this seems a, a good opportunity um, to help authors get their get their work out there as soon as possible. And um, we're running preprints on a, a not-for-profit um, basis, and the long-term plan is to have preprints as as a separate entity um, to MDPI. Um, so what, what is our view and kind of our definition of, of, pre, of a preprint? Well, this, this is a text that we have on our website, uh, which is a preprint is any article that hasn't yet been peer-reviewed and published in an ac academic journal. And in most cases, you can think of it as a draft or working paper, uh, and it can be updated and, and improved at any time. Um, so in essence, what we're thinking of, of a preprint as um, is a uh, something that looks like a research article, an original research article, or a comprehensive review. Um, so we're not including things like editorials, opinion papers, um, commentaries, um, things like um, um, say undergraduate project reports, those kind of things. We are considering um, uh, obviously original research. Um, I think it would be great to have more replication studies published as preprints. Um, Obviously, um, uh, uh, yeah, case, case studies, proof of principle, articles, um, those kind of things. Um, Preprints.org is, is a multidisciplinary uh, preprint um, platform, so we, we've divided it into 12 sections, and we currently uh, we just passed uh, 900 preprints online. Uh, and one thing I found found quite interesting was that we, we very quickly had um, preprints in all of these um, disciplines. Um, and it, it isn't as if one discipline is, is dominating the submissions that we get. So there seems to be quite a broad appetite for, um, for preprints among researchers. Um, we also have uh, advisory board members who act a little bit like an editorial board. Um, they're, they're active researchers who are supporting um, preprints. Um, I thought I would just list a few, a few of the features that we have on the website. So um, obviously we have uh, DOIs assigned for, for every preprint. And you can sign up to be alerted if there's a if there's a, an update or a, a version published in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, you can comment on on articles and and rate them in terms of, of novelty and significance. Um, sorry, novel um, significance or uh, or soundness of, of the article. Um, you can and you can do things like bookmark. You can see related articles, and we we've added alt metrics uh, donuts onto onto the web page as well. So. I don't know if this is very clear, but this is a screenshot of a of a recent preprint that we've that we put online, um, and you can see there's the 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 things you would normally ex expect to see with a with a journal article. So you have the title, the authors, their affiliations, um, abstract, and so on. Um, at the bottom of the page, here we have the, um, the the report of the of the ratings, and and then we have a couple of comments at the bottom of the page, and then on the right hand side. Uh, yeah, we have the alt metrics and a few stats, um, how, how to share and bookmark, and then you can sign up for alerts about the article here. Um, and also, if the if the article is published in a peer-reviewed journal, somewhere in the middle of the page here, we will add a, a, a green box saying um, this has been published in a journal, and add a direct um, link to the to the um, journal article. Um, how does it work from from the author's side? Um, where you can submit either um, by the uh, directly at the preprints.org um, website or from the uh, the MDPI submission system. So anyone who submits to an MDPI journal, at the end of the process, there's a box to say, would you like to um, uh, your your article to appear on preprints? And, and a number of authors are taking advantage of that. And we're also seeing quite a few, um, if you like, spontaneous submissions to preprints.org um, that are independent of, of our journals, which is which is nice. Um, every preprint that comes in has an internal check um, uh, before it goes online, to, and I'll detail that in, in a moment. Um, if there's any borderline cases, then we will consult the advisory board and say, hey, does this look like, like something that's reasonable to put online, or, or should we maybe reject it? Um, and we, we aim to have articles online within 24 hours, which um, so far has, has been achievable in, in almost all cases. So it's really a very rapid process from submission to, to putting the preprint online. Um, so the criteria that, that we're checking with preprints are, firstly, does it, does it look like a research article? Has it got all the, all the parts that you, that you would expect? Does it have the basic structure that you would expect for a, for a research article or review paper? 
Um, we have a look at the author backgrounds, for example, have they have they published in, in this area and, and been cited um, recently? It, this is not something that we would straight out re reject a, a preprint on that, this basis, but maybe if someone is a physicist and suddenly they're publishing a paper about biology, then it's something we would look at in, in more detail. Um, also recent citations, does the preprint, it's just an indication of whether the preprint has in, embedded itself into the current literature. Um, and if it hasn't, it, maybe it's, it's um, not really a very serious paper. Um, we have a read through check for controversial um, topics and, and junk papers and if it's using human, animal or plant subjects then we will just check that the kind of basic ethical requirements uh, for, for those papers are met as well. Um, yeah, I thought I should say something about working with Crossref. Um, to be honest, I don't have much to say because the process was, was really very smooth. Um, we, uh, we helped Crossref to do a bit of testing before they put the, the schema online and uh, even with the testing we found very few things that, that needed changing. Um, as, a, as a publisher we're, we're used to submitting, um, uh, submitting papers for, for DOI numbers um, and the process is, is essentially the same for, um, for preprints. Um, you just have to change the names of, of some of the fields. Um, I, I think probably for, for this audience I don't really need to, to outline the advantages of, of having a, a DOI for, for preprints. Uh, but maybe there's one or two things to, to emphasize uh, which are relevant to preprints as opposed to journal articles. And I, I think they've essentially been already been covered. Um, but having a, a DOI on, on a preprint means that it's, it's citable uh, and it can be seen as, as, a, as a research object. Okay, it has a, a slightly different status to a journal article, um, uh, but at least it's, it, it's, it's recognized and citable. Uh, and the other big advantage with the, the schema that, that um, Crossref have put in place is that the preprint can be linked to the journal article. Um, so for, for, for us, if someone publishes in an MDPI journal, it's, it's very easy for us to make the link between the preprint and the MDPI article. Uh, but via, via DOI numbers, it means we can very easily add a link to, for papers, for, for preprints that are eventually published um, by other publishers. Um, we can we can update the, um, the the data that Crossref holds for the for the um, the, the preprint, um, and then the, the the journal can also update their data if, if they wish to, and there can be a, um, a kind of platform independent link between the two versions. And this is this is really nice and, and something which we we value being a publisher and a, and and a, having a preprint server. Um, we, we don't register DOIs for preprints immediately. We, we give, a, give a grace period. So there's, I, I, the community is still learning a little bit about preprints and, and we get cases where, for example, one author submits a preprint uh, and a co-author will, will come along the, the following day and say, whoa, whoa, hang on, I, this wasn't quite what I was expecting. I didn't want my paper to go online immediately. And we say, okay, this is, this is fine. We'll just take it down. Um, so there's a 48-hour there's a period. Um, where we will uh, before we will make the DOI registration, um, and uh, yeah, in, in the example here that I have at the top of the page, this pre this um, DOI ends with V1, um, and then for each subsequent version, we will we will uh, iterate the the DOI, so it will be V2, V3, and, and so on. Um, just just to finish, kind of outlook of of what uh, may happen with preprints in in the future. Um, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about preprints, but I'm probably probably biased. But I, I think preprints can become um, standard in, in more disciplines, and I think it's something that needs to happen fairly soon uh, for, for them to become uh, more widely accepted. And I think um, uh, ASAP Bio uh, and um, BioArchive, for example, in, in biology and life sciences, are, um, are really helping helping that in in that in that field. Um, I know also the American Chemical Society. Is interested in, in preprint, so maybe that will um, widen the interest within within chemistry. Uh, I, I think it will. Preprints can also help to get peer support at an earlier stage in the publication process. Um, so if you submit a preprint, um, you can get feedback before you submit it to a journal. So in essence, you can have a almost a, a peer review before you make the journal um, application. And I think this is something which can, can raise the standard of journal applications and will be a benefit to authors, um, to publishers and, and to editors in, in the long run. 
Um, and of course, there's the obvious advantage that it speeds up the, the reporting of, of research. And I think this has been seen for many years in, uh, in maths and physics. Um, that, you know, for example, you, you hear that the, uh, you know, a Higgs boson has been discovered based on an archive um, article, and, and then the research art article published in the journal comes, uh, com comes later. And there's also evidence that, um, that if, if something is published as a preprint first in, in maths and physics, that as soon as the journal article is, is published, it starts to accrue um, citations much more quickly than if the, the preprint hadn't been published. Um, and I think there's also an advantage of preprints for early career um, researchers. Uh, as, we, as we heard earlier, a lot of funders um, are starting to recognize preprints. And so they can be added into job applications, grant applications, um, and, and, then, and, and you're not having to wait for you know, months or even years for a peer review process to happen. Um, before you can you can have your your research um, recognised. So yeah, we're hoping that, that preprints will grow, and uh, I know there's a number of initiatives um, springing up uh, in in various disciplines. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you for your attention. Great, um, thanks, Martin, and. Um, yeah, that was um, that was a really good overview. Every every time I had a question, you sort of answered it. But maybe I can think of more by the end. Um, let me now switch over to um, to Richard from um, from BioArchive. Um, perfect. Okay, Richard, we can see your screen. I just need to make sure that we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you as well. Perfect. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks. Hopefully, I should be able to rush through this as um, much of it has been covered already in the, um, in the uh, earlier presentations. Um, so, I guess the first thing to say is that um, to give some background, BioArchive comes from Cold Spring, it's hosted by Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Um, which, for those of you who aren't aware, is um, it's a research institute on the north shore of Long Island in New York with uh, 600 scientific staff, uh, 50 research groups spanning molecular biology, cancer, genetics, neuroscience, plant biology, and genomics. And um, it's for many years been ranked number one in the world by um, Thomson Reuters in the fields of molecular biology and genetics. Um, and I say that not really to, not to blow on Trump here, but just to make the point that um, the bioarchive is it's coming out of a research institute, and we very much see it as part of the research project. Um, but the, the other aspect of Cold Spring Harbor is that we have a very um, strong uh, teaching and education and um, science dissemination program. For more than for about 100 years, um, scientists have been coming to conferences at Cold Spring Harbor to learn about the latest advances advances in um, molecular biology and genetics. Um, we also have a, a, a conference campus in Suzhou in China. Um, we have a graduate school, uh, uh, we do residential lab and lecture courses here. Um, we also run the DNA Learning Center, which teaches high school kids about uh, DNA and genetics. And, um, and then there's course from Harvard Press, which has um, for, for many years published uh, manuals for um, researchers, a variety of textbooks, and um, uh, eight or nine journals. Um, so we, we very much see uh, BioArchive as an extension of this, and so in, in 2013, BioArchive was launched as a, as a preprint server for, for biology. Um, the, the aim was to complement what was being done for the physical sciences by Archive, and we had consulted the founder of Archive, Paul Ginsberg, before launch. It's a non-profit service, uh, submission and access are free, and as I said, it's uh, focused on the biological uh, medical sciences with um, uh, 28 different subject areas. And for our purposes, we define preprint as an unpublished manuscript that's yet to be certified by peer review. Um, uh, there, there seems to be some uh, ambiguity, but uh, we think that's pretty clear. And we, we have a link saying this um, on every page so that if a member of the general public does come across a preprint, they can immediately ascertain what, it, what, what a preprint means and how this differs from something that's been um, refereed. And I think that's particularly uh, important in the current climate. Um, 
So yeah, just to reprise the benefits, rapid transmission of results, getting feedback from colleagues, um, and, and this visibility, uh, especially for early career scientists. Um, and I think it's important to, to emphasize for the early career scientists, this is because the publication process um, in tra traditional journals really is at, at odds with the time scale for career progression among young scientists in, um, in particular. So a preprint will make will allow them to make their way by their work available to grant um, grant viewers and hiring committees. And this this slide really just makes that point. Um, you can see in blue the sort of median time for um, a journal for, for a paper to be published for submission all the way through to publication is around seven or eight months. And that's with a single journal and most people go through more than one. And uh, you know the range goes up to about three years. It's not uncommon to encounter people in that scenario. And of course, a preprint, by contrast, on bioarchive, it's, it's typically available within 24 hours. So that's the kind of acceleration of dissemination that um, both Jessica and Martin referred to. So the features of bioarchive, um, as before, it's, it's uh, date stamped, given a DOI. Um, it's indexed in Google Scholar. And um, uh, the growing number of next generation uh, discovery tools, um, we classify papers as new, confirmatory, or contradictory um, contradictory results. And those latter two categories are really to provide an opportunity for um, studies in reproducibility, which, which typically um, people have had trouble publishing in journals. So that gets to this point that there may be a class of preprint that actually never ends up in a journal. Um, the uh, preprint on bioarchives can be revised at any time. We have a wide choice of licenses so that um, Choices that the author makes later in the process um, are, are, are not problematic. Uh, we provide article metrics, commenting on the published versions. This just so shows what the site looks like. You can see the list of papers, um, the list of different subject areas on the right-hand side. Any on an individual paper, there's the, um, the DOI link, um, the abstract, and uh, uh, a number of other links, including critically the download link. Um, to, to, to obtain the author's PDF file. Um, our history tab shows the, the version history, um, and the metrics tab shows the article level metrics, which are provided by Highwire Press, and alt metrics provided by altmetrics.com. Um, here's an example of a paper that subsequently appeared in the journal. We put up a link. Um, we have scripts that go and find these. This one was published in Nature. And we now also pass on those matches to Crossref so that they can um, match the DOR records as was described earlier. So after three years, we've had um, about 8,000 submissions, around 90% of which um, pass the screening process. 30% of these are revised, many more than once. And we have a total of, um, I think the last calculation was somewhere in the region of 30,000 authors. And if you look back two years, you find that more than 60% of the papers have gone on to be published in journals. Um, this is there's probably some false negatives there because titles and authors have changed. And of course, some papers may take more than two years to get into a journal. But I think it just makes the point that most of them are ending up in journals. And in fact, more than 400 journals have published papers that first appeared as preprints on bioarchive. Um, over the course of this three years, we've seen a lot of change in the community. Many more biologists are now posting preprints, and, and, and particularly in subject areas that had never heard of them before or never considered doing this. Um, I, I would say now, after in the, in the course of those three years, it's now very much the exception to be a journal that won't consider a preprint. Um, some of the clinical journals have yet to catch up, but in basic biology, most journals will allow you to post a preprint. Um, and as Jessica said, we've seen a lot of rule changes with funding bodies not only allowing um, authors to cite preprints and grant applications, but actively encouraging this. Um, this just, chart just shows the growth over um, uh, the last three years, which I think you can see is really ramping up. Um, and this shows the breakdown by subject category. So it's interesting that a lot of this has been driven by genomics and evolutionary biology. Um, and bioinformatics, um, where there's been a, a lot of former physicists, a lot of hard scientists, com computational scientists who are familiar with archive. So they were really the, the early adopters. But I think it's unlikely that um, this will remain a niche area, because if you look at the equivalent chart for archive, you'll see that when they started 25 years ago, it was very much dominated by high energy physics. 
but over the years, all the other other disciplines uh, caught up, and we very much expect the same thing to happen in biology. Um, when you look at the impact it's making, we're seeing citations of uh, bioarchive articles. Uh, there's a substantial amount of commenting on the site. This is provided by Discuss, and about 11% of papers receive comments. This might seem low, but it's much, much higher than you see in traditional journals. Um, there are numerous blogs uh, springing up to Discuss uh, preprints on bioarchive, and we know from authors that they're getting a lot of private feedback via email. And um, there's a huge amount of social media attention. I think sometime last year we, we calculated that there'd be more than 100,000 Twitter mentions of bioarchive papers. But that's, um, that, as I say, that was about a year ago. And, and frankly, we've given up counting. Um, one of the things we've tried to do to make the process much easier for authors is tightly integrate with journals. So we have these technologies, J2B and B2J, that allow an author who's posted a paper in bioarchive with a single click to submit to one of more than 50 journals, I think it is now. And, and a subset of those journals also have a thing called J2B, which allows an author who posts who submits to the journal to click a button and immediately have that preprint uh, posted in bioarchive. Um, and as, as Jessica mentioned, this integration has gone further <coughs> excuse me, with um, um, many editors actively um, uh, prospecting for potential submissions within bioarchive and plus, gen plus genetics um, being, the, being the one journal that actually formalized this by assigning uh, preprint editors. But we know it goes on with a lot of journals. Um, we've also got um, integration with conferences. So we've seen a lot of people posting preprints around the time they give a conference presentation. So this is in some ways putting a marker in the ground. In the ground. It also allows people who attend the conference to alert their colleagues when they get back to the, the, the details of the, the, the research they heard about at the conference. Um, so that's, that's proven very popular. Um, there's also certain communities that really want to create a, a, a nexus within bioarchive um, for their, their particular field. So this is uh, uh, Pharmacometrics, for example, has a dedicated channel on bioarchive to really try and crystallize the, the field um, uh, around use of preprints which we're seeing more and more of. Um, and so I think that the concluding point I'd make is that within this ecosystem, we really see um, bioarchive as an essential hub that allows um, people to communicate before the work is certified by journals. It allows people to post reproduce, reproducibility studies and, um, and really connect um, a, a kind of like a formal literature with, with meetings and blogs. And, and obviously, we connect to um, they, these kind of new discovery tools, as I say, Google Scholar, um, Crossref, of course, and um, uh, Meta, that was uh, recently acquired by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, is um, in the process of indexing bioarchive. And I think, so as I said, I think you know we see it as an essential hub, and it was kind of nice to see that I think um, many people in the community feel the same way. We about sometime last year we went down for an hour, and it's interesting that. Um, Suddenly on, on Twitter, there are a bunch of researchers saying, you know, what's going on? And um, Michael Hoffman, who's been involved um, with BioArchive for a while, said, congratulations. You know, the fact that people were getting annoyed by this in, uh, indicated that they really um, feel that BioArchive is an essential utility. And I think that's where we are today. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I will, um, let me see, I will take back control of the screen. Um, but yeah, just again, just to um, to reiterate my thanks to um, my thanks to the um, the panelists. Um, as said, it was really useful to be able to uh, just to get insights into you know what you've been working on in your particular organisations and in um, and, and your thoughts on the sort of wider industry in general. Um, if you're happy to stay in the line, we've also been joined by um, by Jennifer Lynn, who's the Director of Product Management at, um, at Crossref. But we have had some questions from the, um, from the attendees that I'd just like to pick up on. Um, so, yeah, um, 
just to throw right there, so um, probably one more for um, for Martin and Richard, um, but a question just to ask, how are preprint servers updating their pages when the article is published in the journal? Um, where, where are they getting that information? Um, well, I can yeah. answer for bio archives. We, we, we run various scripts where, which, which search things like PubMed and, um, and Crossref looking, looking for matches. Um, and that, that, that's how we work, what we work. And then what we do is we, we send an email to the author, the preprint author, and say, we found a match. We think this is, this, this is the paper derived from your preprint. Um, let us know if it isn't. And then we yeah, very, very similar. Yeah, so um, ve very similar for us. Um, we we have a, a, a database of, of articles which we are constantly updating, um, and we we check through that for matches. Um, and so we're yeah we're not just picking up MDPI papers, but um, papers from from other journals as well. Um, and yeah, if we see something that looks like a match, um, we we will check it out. Um, Put put the uh, put the match online and check with the authors that they are happy with that. I probably, I probably, the other thing I would add is that we also do a screen. Part of our screening process is running um, paper, the submissions through Authenticate. So if we find a paper that is already published, then we reject it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and then I guess, um, so, and this actually would have been one of my questions, so Richard, I think you'd, you'd answered this in, um, in your piece about, um, the, about the comments. Um, so I think you said about 11% of the, the manuscripts that were published on BioArchive were, um, were receiving comments, which is, which is a pretty, which is a pretty good hit rate. Um, Martin, is it, um, because I think you, on the screen that you showed, there was a page to show that there was sort of a commenting feature on preprints.org. Are, are you measuring sort of how many how many articles are getting comments as well? Um, yeah, it, it's something we would like to see more of, and it's it's an area we're going to work on this year to see how we how we can attract more comments. But we are getting you know we are getting uh, comments on um, on papers. Um, so it's it's not zero. I, I would say it's. I don't know what the exact number is. It's it's probably not as high as as uh, 10 10 percent or so that, that Richard was talking about. Um, but yeah, we are starting to see comments and some some pretty substantial comments, which which uh, you know, useful to the authors in terms of review, not just hey this is a great paper, but actually giving some good feedback to authors. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then another question. So. Um, when asking about um, how do you deal with um, corrections or retractions of preprints? Um, yeah, our, our um, retraction, correct, I mean, for a correction, it, uh, the author can just submit a, um, a new version of the preprint, this is fine. Um, for retractions, our policy is essentially the same as a, as a, journal, as a journal policy, so we will, we will retract the preprint um, if there is um, serious kind of un irredeemable uh, problems with the paper, you know, that can't be fixed by updating it, or if there's um, some very serious ethical um, concerns or, or legal issues, that's essentially our, our retraction policy. Cool. Yeah, I think we're, we're probably similar. I'm slightly loath to use the word retraction, though. I mean, you know, there are circumstances under which, I mean, but there are circumstances under which we would re remove a paper if there were sort of legal issues or serious ethical breaches, that type of thing. Um, but I think we shouldn't forget that retraction is is a phrase used in, in the context of journals when essentially the journal receives information that um, means that they, they no longer feel the judgment that they made through peer review was appropriate, and the um, information and and the information is now no longer believed to be correct. Um, so of course the difference with the preprint is that no such judgment has ever been made or implied. So for for from the correction side, an author can keep updating something, and we would we would encourage um, we would encourage authors if they find things prove to be wrong to put that as part as an update. But it's it. it but you know the, the, the word retraction pre refers to a, a formalized journal process, which is really connected with third-party decisions on the content. And I think it's important to make the point that 
the whole thing about preprints is there is no third party certification being made. So it's not like we can undo something if we've never done it in the first place. So I think there are categories <coughs> of things that, w that w would be removed um, to do with sort of severe ethical breaches or you know legal legal issues. But I think I don't think we would use the retraction in the way it's commonly used because most retractions in journals indicate a judgment made by the journal that they no longer stand by their assessment of the paper. Um, and, and so a preprint, you haven't made any assessment in, in the first place. So I think you, you one needs to be cautious about that. And also we should certainly be cautious about something, you know, the, 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 when you assign a DOI to something, you know, <clears throat> in many respects, the notion is that you're doing that to provide a permanent link to this object. So you should be very wary of pulling that object down just because, you know, somebody doesn't believe it. Yeah, no, I think um yeah, I think that's um I think that's a good point and yeah, and a useful distinction. Um a question um um to ask, so what can a journal do to cl to close the loop in a preprint? Um, so this publisher is talking about ways of acknowledging published articles that originated as preprints, um, and sort of adding the preprint into the into the version history. Um, if I can talk to sort of the other question that um, that was posed so um, by um, by the same attendees, we were sort of talking about. Um, maybe why we have a specific DOI for a preprint rather than the preprint DOI being um, I guess sort of a versioned DOI of the you know of the you know having one DOI kind of continue start the process as a preprint and then move right the way through to being the accepted manuscript of the version of record with some sort of versioning within that DOI um, I can talk to that a little bit just um, from the very cross-ref perspective um, the fact is that the um, you might want you you would want to cite the the preprint and the 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 published manuscript would be very different from our perspective anyway for in in terms of citing for citation purposes. So if I want to cite something that's been published on BioArchive using the DOI, the citation metadata and the information is going to be very different to um, to, to what ends up potentially being published. Um, as Richard said, maybe more than two years down the line. So it's useful to be able to have separate DOIs because there are different, for it, in a lot of cases, there are different kind of owners of the DOIs who are who are um, who are um, basically setting up to to maintain and steward that content so that it can be there permanently. So having links within the the metadata rather than having the DOI pass right the way through the process is a useful distinction to make in terms of citation. Um, but with that in mind and having kind of the, the I, DOI, f sorry, go on. I was just going to add to that that I think actually there's an opportunity there for journals as well because having that important category distinction means that um, I think I think we will see this and um, that a standard hasn't been arrived at but you can imagine going to um, going into a reference list in a journal article and seeing a list of ref list of citations and then being coded slightly differently by, based on the DOI category so that people would immediately know that the, the distinction between things that had been peer-reviewed and and things that hadn't and that that may be actually useful to the reader. So I think that's a that's a further justification for um, the point you were making. Cool. Yeah. No, I um yeah, I agree. I, th I think um as well we were sort of talking about say plagiarism detection as well and part of what sometimes people find difficult is is finding a paper online and being able to say, okay, is this a paper that's been published in a peer reviewed journal or is it a preprint? And you know, how do you then deal with the, the sort of overlaps in text? Is it okay? Is it not? And just as you said, having clear ways to, to see that is um, is really valuable. Um, but yeah, sorry, to double back to the, um, the initial question. So just asking what a journal can do to kind of close the loop on a, on a preprint and um, how to sort of acknowledge published articles that, that originated as preprints, if you, if you had any thoughts on that.
Um, this is Jessica. Just to, to bring in about the, the way that Biophysical Journal is, is doing that, um, I think that they're doing it essentially as a footnote. Um, but I could imagine that this information could be surfaced automatically through Crossref metadata um, in the display of the article itself as well. Um, I've definitely heard different dis you know, discussions about how it should be done. Sometimes I get a lot of scientists asking me if they should cite their own preprint in the reference list, which doesn't seem uh, altogether appropriate. So um, I agree that uh, some of these other mechanisms um, would be useful. Yeah, I think I think having a you know, the display issue is 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 you know there will be vari var variations on how people display them. I would imagine that ultimately coding it in a footnote is, is not going to be the, the solution going forward. But you know, so long as it's it, it's metadata that is associated with the with the article record, then it can be pulled and displayed in a number of different different ways. But I think the key is is to have it as metadata rather than as kind of like free text in a footnote, which obviously is not appropriate. Yeah, I, I think there's also a difficulty to know exactly what you would count as a as a preprint. I mean, if someone puts puts a, an article in a say their own university repository, does that count as a preprint or not? Um, I I don't know. Um, and I, uh, obviously, publishers could could ask in their submission um, software for uh, for authors to to add the DOI of a preprint. Um, on the other hand, it, it's quite a lot of effort. It would it would require effort from publishers um, to to go out looking for preprints of submitted articles. Um, I don't know whether the majority of publishers would be willing to do that. Um, but uh, if, if if any publishers wanted to come to us and and set up some um, some kind of link to to look for uh, look for for possible links, then um, yeah, that would be that would be interesting for us. Yeah, I think yeah, I would agree. I think we 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 were skeptical about the. Um, Ability of publishers to to actually do that, um, and, we, and we felt that, of course, however, have we if we have already deposited with Crossref the fact that there's a match from our preprint to the um, the journal DOI, then the journal DOI should be able to pull that and display it. Okay, I'm um, I'm conscious that we're coming um, that we're coming up to to the R. So I've got a couple of other questions in the channel. Um, if you've asked other questions in the channel, what I'll do is I'll take those offline and relay them to either answer them or relay them to um, to our panelists um, so that I can get you a response. But um, again, firstly, just to, to thank um, our panelists today. Um, that was really useful, interesting information and um, and good questions from the audience as well. So again, thank you for, for joining the webinar and we'll follow up via email with slides and a recording. Um, but yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.